This presentation will discuss different types of examples of how rape culture is ingrained in our culture, history, and systems. We will also review different aspects of how rape culture is exhibited throughout our daily lives. Rape culture is a widely used term describing a system of beliefs in which rape and sexual violence are common and inevitable. The term that was coined by feminists in the United States in the 1970s. The term to capture the prevalent attitudes, norms, practices, and how the media condones, normalizes, uses, and even encourages sexualized violence. It includes things like sexist jokes, victim blaming, minimizing sexual violence, and sexual objectification. Rape culture is a complex set of beliefs that encourages male sexual aggression and supports violence against women, non-masculine males, transgender individuals, and really anyone who is not conforming to rigid gender roles. In a society where violence is seen as sexy and sexuality as violent, in a rape culture, women as well as LGBT people experience a continuum of threatened violence that ranges from sexual remarks to touching to rape itself. These constant social messages create norms. Over time, these norms create our history. A rape culture condones physical and emotional terrorism against women as a norm. In a rape culture, people of all genders assume that sexual violence is a fact of life or inevitable. However, much of what we accept as inevitable, in fact, the experience of values and attitudes that can change. We believe that rape culture can change, but we have to know about it and talk about it to figure out how and why it's happening so that we can undo it. In this presentation, we are looking at aspects of our lives that contribute to and make up rape culture. Everyday experiences like street harassment and rape jokes institutions and systems like school dress codes, cultural and societal norms like victim blaming, gender education, our news, our music, our movies, and more. All, all the aspects when combined show a comprehensive picture of how and why sexual assault continues to be tolerated and even encouraged in our society. It is why sexual violence continues to persist. So let's go through some of these examples. Street harassment has a wide range of behaviors that are harmful and constitute sexual. Sexual harassment is sexual, gender-based, and bias-motivated harassment that takes place in public spaces like the street, the supermarket, and on social media that we use every day. As its core, uh, at its core is a power dynamic that constantly reminds historically subordinated and marginalized groups that our vulnerability to assault in public spaces. Street harassment punishes women, LGBTQ folks, and other marginalized groups for just being themselves in the world. Street harassment is not about sexual gratification, it is about power. If sexual harassment were about getting dates, it would be spectacularly unsuccessful strategy. Instead, street harassment is about putting people in their place. Sometimes it's sexual, sometimes it's racist, sometimes it's homophobic, and sometimes it's all of the above or more. Whatever form it takes, it tells us that we're not safe in the physical or online spaces that we're inhabiting, that we share with friends, family, relatives, acquaintances, and strangers. Some actions are commonly overlooked as part of the continuum of violence, such as whistles, comments about appearance, leering, demanding a smile, or sexually explicit 
uh, gestures. More overt behaviors are generally understood as sexual harassment, such as groping, indecent exposure, stalking, etc. The former is addressed in the image here from Stop Telling Women to Smile. This is an art series by Tatiana Fazla Lazade. Her work attempts to address gender based street harassment by placing drawn portraits of women composed with captions that speak directly to offenders in outside public spaces. In schools, there are many ways that rape culture is forced for those of us that are, um, young people in society. Dress codes that treat or describe girls' bodies as destructive. Abstinence only sex education. Social expectations and pressure on prominent activity. Inadequate sexual assault and harassment policies. Expecting and tolerating violent displays of masculinity in athletics. Another way that rape culture um, is enforced is through how these institutions are setting up their rules, their policies, how they respond to sexual assault and harassment, how they teach. Um, all of these things can indirectly promote sexual assault and bolster sexism. For example, school dress codes can support the idea that clothing suggested, uh, suggestive or not is, ex is an acceptable way to determine the amount of respect others deserve. School administrators typically believe dress codes benefit the school environment by placing an emphasis on education and reducing distractions for students. However, when we examine dress codes at schools, we can often see that girls' bodies are targeted as inappropriate. Uh, using examples like too much cleavage, bare shoulders, leggings, shorts, and short skirts. When sent home, told to change or told not to wear them again, the message is usually that their outfits are distracting, which uh, is another way of saying it's tempting boys are men. This distracting message is a coded way schools and institutions begin sexualizing young girls. Children under no circumstances should be told that their clothing is responsible for another person's bad behaviors. We really need to emphasize this message as it continues to happen in very gendered ways where girls are blamed for boys' behaviors, which sets the stage for future views on sex and gender roles and more overt uh, elements of rape culture. We're going to talk now about the legal system responses. Look at the national statistics for rape compared with the statistics for assault and battery. From RAIN, uh, the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, it shows the differences between uh, legal systems responses for rape versus assault and battery crimes. There is a disparity and a social leniency toward rape as opposed to other and generally less serious violent crimes like general assault and battery. Less than half of all rapes are actually reported. Only 3% of rapists spend even one day in jail. Campus rates haven't changed in the last 20 years. While only two to 8% of, of uh, reports may be false, students actually think up to 50% of rape reports are fabricated or made up. Think about the following questions. How do you think these statistics make people who have been sexually assaulted feel? Do you think they feel like reporting to the police? Do you think these statistics embolden offenders? 
do you think they could embolden someone who has not even yet been an offender to commit sexual assault? Pause the recording here and write down some of your reflections. Continuing on with some more specifics around the legal system's responses. Uh, in March 2016, a Santa Clara County jury found Brock Turner guilty of three felony assault. The conviction stemmed from the charming or athletic, wealthy, white, uh, he's described in all those ways, Stanford student's arrest in 2015 after his victim blacked out at a frat party and woke up in a hospital covered in pine needles and dried blood. She'd been found by two passersby, unconscious behind a dumpster, dressed around with her dress around her waist, naked from the waist down, with Turner raping her. The passersby saw him raping her. He tried to make a run for it, but they chased him and pinned him to the ground until the police showed up. Despite the minimum sentence associated with these kinds of convictions, Brock Turner was sentenced to six months in county jail and probation, although he only served three months. In a letter he read to the judge, he described himself as an inexperienced drinker and party goer. His dad argued that his son should not be sent to prison for 20 minutes of action. This case really highlighted rape culture for a lot of people. It angered so many people. Um, while this kind of thing has been happening for quite a while, but it got a lot of media attention. Many different systems failed this victim. She, her name is Chanel Miller, this is her. And um, at the time, and for a couple of years, she was known as Emily Doe. Her uh, identity was protected, but she wrote a um, memoir recently called Know My Name, and this is it. Reflect on um, ways that this case resulted from and contributed to rape culture. Think about the messages the outcome of this case gives young people, you know, younger people watching news at the time or seeing things posted on social media. And locate the male privilege, the white privilege, the class privilege, the athlete privilege in this case. Victim blaming includes beliefs, attitudes, and actions which effectively blame the victim of rape for the rape itself include comments and questions like, why didn't you scream? Why did you go to their house? Why were you drinking or drunk? Do you understand how this will affect their life when reported? I just don't believe that they would do that. Like the dress code issue we talked about earlier, again, the girl is responsible for not tempting boys and men. Can you see how that dress code piece is connected to this and how it creates a culture where this continues to be bolstered? I also think that it can be an easier way for people to understand and wrap their head around something terrible happening by denying that it happens or minimizing it because it's too terrible. Rape culture manifests in a myriad of ways, but its most devilish trick is to make the average non-criminal person identify with the person accused instead of the person reporting the crime. Rape culture encourages us to scrutinize victim stories for any evidence that they brought the violence onto themselves and always to imagine ourselves in the terrifying role of good man, falsely accused, before we rush to judgment. And that's a quote by Kate Harding. Think about if you've heard statements like these before and have you ever thought them? 
it's okay if you've thought them before, that would be normal, right? Uh, we're talking about a, uh, a culture and we are all part of that culture. And our brains have been socialized by these cultures as we've um, gone through our stages of development. It's our job to um, address them when they do come up and to say, oh, okay, where does this come from? Why am I thinking this, right? And to begin to unlearn and unpack that and help others unlearn and unpack it as well. Rape culture is not good, but it is normal, right? And victim blaming is a part of that. Media messages um, often uh, about consent and sexual violence uh, just reinforce the norms of rape culture. These are often hidden in plain sight. Hot sauce packet. Consent should and can be a normalized part of a healthy Advertising, we could be more creative. Um, reinforcing consent versus um, reinforcing rape culture and sexual violence. Consent is an agreement between individuals prior to any sexual activity that clearly communicates which activities each person is comfortable engaging in. Consent can be withdrawn by either individual at any point in time. Consent is often used in talking about sex, but there are a lot of ways consent can be practiced. Are there different kinds of uh, ways to practice consent or examples of practicing consent that you can think of that don't have to do with sex. One example is that parents allowing children, their children to make a choice about hugging another relative instead of it being accepted, expected. Um, even when our family members are all safe people and that hugging them doesn't do any particular harm, that there's no danger of sexual violence in our families. It helps to create uh, bodily autonomy in children so that they feel they have a right to say no. They feel empowered to protect their bodies if they want to. It's not about that, that grandma is unsafe. It's about we don't know who else is unsafe and how do we create more choice for children about what they do in their bodies. Media messages about gender, particularly uh, women um, support rape culture by picturing them as property or prizes to be won, as valuable as an object, and this is objectification. Objectification distances us from other people and makes it easier to excuse or condone violence. Objectification is a critical component of rape culture because it means to make someone else an object or a thing, something or some, making someone less than a full person. This is why offenders only offend on some people and not all people they come in contact with. So then who becomes objects and how do they become objects? What are these pictures implying here? And what's the message that you get? Examples are uh, historical um, discussions of property, uh, of family and women. Women are to be one, like um, example of trophy wife or, or uh, using the term scoring. And just being used as an object. Calling someone a name like a slut or other names that are negative or inanimate make it so much easier to dehumanize them, treat them as less than. In middle school or in elementary school, girls that have developed faster than others in their class might be referred to as tits instead of their name. This is making a person a body part and not a person anymore. This is also an extension of sexism. 
or how rape culture is rooted in that sexism. Male entitlement. Uh, female identified individuals are not the only ones who are internalizing sexist messages. Men and boys are also receiving these same messages. We're going to look at uh, how some of these beliefs can be seen as warning signs, uh, one of the th and, and how um, sexism also um, hurts men as well um, as women. The idea of the friend zone supports the gender expectation that men are owed sex. An example of that, um, <clears throat> uh, it, it, the friend zone is a great example of that. We're gonna kind of get into that a little bit more. So the term refers to a platonic relationship where one person has unrequited romantic feelings for the other um, and uh, figuring out how to get out of the friend zone has become one of the cornerstones of internet culture and sitcoms and reality TV. Um, the friend zone is inherently sexist. Although the term friend zone is uh, gender neutral, it is most often uh, used to describe male to female relationships where the male is the friend zone and the female is the uh, object of the unrequited love or sex. This is not because women aren't friend zoned, but because women are conditioned to be less vocal about their sexual desires. Women more generally internalize it and say, oh, I must be doing something wrong. All relationships, romantic or platonic, require some degree of work or investment. Being a good friend entails a willingness to do this work and it's ludicrous to expect sex in return. The friend zone pigeonholes us into having only one thing to offer as women. Having a good friend is, the, is appropriate reciprocity for being a good friend. The friend zone implies women are simply only good for sex and friendship is worthless. When this kind of thing escalates from these microaggressions uh, to more fatal violence, it can look like um, Elliot Rogers, who became a mass shooter in Santa Barbara, killing seven people, including himself. His manifesto stated he wanted to punish women for rejecting him and to punish men for having the life he claimed he deserved. The outbursts of violent masculinity, especially acts rooted in misogyny or the hatred of women, are becoming more common. Almost half the mass shooting happening in the last eight years and seven in 2012. There are also incidents that don't make national headlines like a high school senior in Connecticut who stabbed to death a classmate who declined his invitation to prom. This, this scenario, these couple scenarios are connected with a broader kind of newer movement of incels or involuntary celibates who blame women for the lack of sex they have in their life. There are higher rates of sexual harassment, sexual assault, uh, and sexual violence in general toward people from communities that have experienced marginalization. In the purple that goes around are, is the kind of the spectrum of sexual violence from rape or mur and murder to uh, flashing, to voyeurism, to gender violence normalized, um, connected to this kind of multicolor flower in the middle of all the different isms, all the different kinds of oppression. For example, 
racism helps to contribute to a culture where people are made less human or objects, just as the objectification we discussed earlier with women. If someone views another race as less than, again, it makes it easier for a perpetrator to justify in their own minds abuse toward that person. Again, racist or homophobic name calling creates an atmosphere where human beings that are African American or gay are seen as less than and therefore more deserving of abuse. What are the thoughts that you have about this? What connections do you see in media or in your life between rape culture and these isms? Pause the recording here and write down your reflections. So we're gonna get into that a little bit more. <laughs> 